emissions are associated with the consumption of energy in the, in the house, so it's operational uh, energy rather than necessarily associated with its embodied um, energy, um, and over, over the course uh, of, of a year. So that was the sort of the definition um, that, we, that we used uh, for, for this particular house. Um, how do we uh, achieve um, zero emissions? Well, it's a, it's a combination uh, of ways that, that buildings can, can achieve this. You basically want to, you want to bring down uh, actual energy demand uh, in, in the home, uh, of course. And uh, coupled with that, you then want to tie it in with a renewable uh, energy uh, supply. Um, usually it's going to be uh, PV. Uh, and it's really this crossover point, when if, you, if you're match, matching your, uh, your supply with your demand, that you're going to get that zero emission status in, in the definition that, that, that we use. Um, and really what we developed, we developed the Aussie uh, program uh, to say that a house that achieves that magic status there would be considered an Aussie 10. So 100% are covered by its um, renewable energy uh, supply. Wouldn't it? It's 100% uh, of its demand. So the house it's, itself now, it's an interesting when people have asked, oh, you know, why was it built this way? Why was it done um, in, in the way we were about it? We purposely chose uh, a volume builder, such as uh, in, in the case of Henley. Uh, we purposely chose that we wanted to demonstrate that mainstream housing could achieve uh, these zero emissions. You, you could build a high efficiency our home using fairly stock standard building practices and using a, a volume uh, builder to, to achieve that. So we didn't want to have a sort of a, a one-off home that was sort of saying, mm, it's, it's nice, but geez, I wouldn't, want to, wouldn't really want to live in that. The whole idea was to build a home that mum and dad buyers could walk in and say, oh yeah, this has got everything in it that, that, that I like. This is um, this has got all the facilities, all, all the, the, type, the type of uh, some pieces that go into a house that, that, that I want uh, and, and that it's not going to cost um, uh, that much more than building a stock standard house. So as you can see, it, it's relatively large. That's pretty much smack on uh, the average uh, for homes uh, that are built, uh, detached homes that are built at 240 square metres, that includes the garage. It rated at 8.2 stars, so people are familiar with the uh, star rating system that's used for, for new uh, houses. We have a minimum requirement now of, six, of a six-star rating. Um, the, the house achieved an 8.2-star rating. To get to 10 stars, for those that just, just to let you know, 10, the 10-star, 10 if you get to a 10-star rating in a home, that effectively means that you don't need any artificial heating and cooling uh, in, in the home. Uh, it gets progressively more and more difficult to get to that 10-star level. So around about that 8-star level, we think is a fairly good sweep point. Um, as far as achieving good, good thermal comfort uh, without uh, blowing uh, the construction budget. Had a fairly large PV array on it. It's got a six kilowatt PV system sitting on its roof. And of course, it, it uh, had all the low energy lights, appliances. We put in a full control uh, and monitoring system because we wanted to see how this house is actually going to uh, perform. And we also did other stuff that sits outside of, this, of the energy space, but with water efficient systems, so it had uh, water capture for um, the grey water which was used for the toilets and for the laundry and, and in the garden and things like, and things like that. That's the, uh, what I say, it was, we had it uh, been fully uh, monitored. Um, so all the power that was generated on site from the PVs, we monitored uh, that. We looked at how much was drawn, how much power was drawn from, from the grid. We used the grid as, as the battery, so we didn't have standalone batteries um, in, in the home. Again, because that's the, at the time the house, but that was a very expensive, still is a very expensive option to do that. So we did use utilize the grid as our, as our, as our battery. Um, the house did have uh, air conditioning um, and, and, and heating. People again have sort of said, oh, that's a bit of a, you know, if you're trying to build a passive designed home, why did you put um, an air conditioning uh, unit in there? It was probably more um, a market driven uh, option there, but again, with the whole idea, and again, working with people like him, said, you know, if you're going to mark, make these homes marketable to the general public, you know, people do want a heating and cooling uh, system uh, in, in their home. So we did have one um, in there. Um, 
electric uh, hot, the, hot, the entire house was was electric. Uh, so we had an electric hot uh, water booster. Um, oven and cooktops were uh, monitored, refrigerator, washing machine, dishwasher. So we had about 20 different circuits um, in the home that were all being individually uh, monitored by our um, our system. And you can see there that photo down down there is the bank of submeters. Um, it's, it's interesting to see how our technology has, has moved on. At the time that we, that we wired this house up, there really was no off-the-shelf system uh, for uh, monitoring circuit-by-circuit circuit, uh, energy consumption, so we pretty much had to build one ourselves, and it's a whole lot of uh, submeters. So it took up an entire wall um, in, our, uh, in, the, in the garage of, of, of the home. Yeah. Have you got uh, figures on all those meterings for right. the year? Yeah, we'll, 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 get, we'll get on to it. Yep, sure do. Um, we also came up with uh, at top screen, the house had an in-home display um, unit uh, as well. And um, we developed that. This was developed in conjunction with the Trobe uh, University. And, and the idea was to try and give the occupants, we put a family in, into this home, um, and the idea was to try and give those occupants uh, a sense of how their home is performing and, and, and give them an indication of are they doing well, are they doing bad. So I don't know how well you can see there in, in the pictures, but you can see the different spaces have got different um, tones. We've got some that's green, it's a bit of a yellow, we've got a red uh, up there. And that was basically that green means that that zone is your energy consumption and that zone you're doing, you're doing fine. If it's, if it's red, uh, something funny is going on that, and, and you could touch on that and it would give you an indication of what's consuming the energy uh, in that particular zone of the house. And the idea was that then they, then they could potentially make a conscious decision to switch, some, switch whatever it was off. Um, so that, that these in-home displays that try and provide the user with a simple interface, simple feedback mechanisms was what we were t t uh, testing out uh, as well. So, uh, yeah, so what we, we did, we basically collected just, uh, it was actually, we collected about two years worth of, of data on this house. We put um, uh, our family, a family, it was fairly, a fairly um, large family as it, tur as it turned out. Uh, there was um, three adults and three, or uh, two younger kids and a, and a teenager in there, in there as well. So there was quite a, a large uh, family that was that was in the home, which is something that we weren't actually expecting and um, it did have consequences uh, for, <laughs> for, the, uh, for how the house actually uh, performed. But you can see there that, uh, that the energy consumption in the house was pretty much dominated by the HVAC uh, system and also uh, the hot water system. Those two things uh, are alone are, are, are much more than 50% uh, of the total energy consumption um, in, in the house. So um, a lot of the other things were only, actually only quite uh, small uh, energy consumers, but it was really those two things uh, that were uh, significant uh, draws of the energy. Michael, what takes 12% of the energy in the living room? Uh, entertainment systems. What, yes. the TV yeah, yeah, and I'll get on to I'll get on to that because uh, it was interesting looking at and it comes back a lot to the human behaviour about how people we, we we purposely put this this family in without with, with giving them virtually no uh, information at all on on how to operate the house. The whole idea was if you just throw somebody if you throw a family a stock standard family into a home like this, how how's it going to go? Um, you know, uh, so that's what we, we did, but it, it was interesting because the house we, in an attempt to provide uh, energy efficient appliances, we actually provided things like uh, an energy efficient fridge, and we actually uh, included two at the time energy efficient uh, uh, televisions um, in in the home. But of course, silly silly us, we didn't was realised having a family moving in, they had all their stuff as well. So they weren't going to leave that unplugged sitting in the garage. <laughs> they plugged all their other stuff in. So we had was it four televisions in the end. Adam? We had four, four, and we had two big plasmas. They had the bar. They had the fridge going into the garage, which is why that in fact that why that garage was actually red. That was the that was the bar fridge. That was the beer fridge. That was the beer fridge, buddy. Um, so yeah, it was interesting that it, it, although we had tried to say, oh, okay, we're going to provide them with all this stuff, we didn't actually probably should have built into into the whole project. Say, and you're not allowed to plug in all your stuff that you bring with you. 
um, but they did. So uh, again, it's an interesting exercise in, in the human behaviour uh, side of things. Um, so actual versus expected. So this is where it does a little bit um, uh, interesting and uh, from, from a researcher's point of, of, of view. So they have, this is what we expect. So we did modelling on it. There's some fairly sophisticated modelling uh, that we did. And this is pretty much what we uh, expected the house to do. So it's going to be a pretty flat line um, uh, performance over, over, over the year. Uh, popping up a little bit in, in, in June and July because, again, the house is all electric. So that was the, the heating. There was going to be a bit of a, we are a heating dominated uh, climate. So there's going to be a little bit of a heating requirement there uh, for, for the home. Um, in that June, July uh, period. Michael? Yeah. Uh, the energy kilowatt hour, is that what, per month, week? Uh, that would be per month. Right. Yeah, yeah. It is a little bit, I must admit, look, it's a little bit, uh, I, had to, I had to do a bit of a refresher on, on this. It's been a while since I've actually done a presentation on, on this uh, particular uh, project. So um, you can see with it, David, you can see whether you can trip, trip me up with, you said you were going to bring tricky questions. David's another CSIRO pod. So he said he was going to bring tricky questions for me. I sure wouldn't think of. Okay, the, so that was so the, the, the dark line there, that's what the house expected. The, the, that line that there, that's what we expected the PV. So you can see there, we thought we were going to be well and truly uh, safe, safe as houses as far as meeting the zero emission um, uh, target. The PVs were going to, you know, Romp it in as far as uh, providing the uh, the energy uh, for for the house. Um, that's what the PVs actually did. So they they tracked pretty pretty close. There's some reasons why um, they didn't do quite as well, and I've got some information on that it's mainly it was mainly to do with uh, we had a built that summer that we monitored over was a particularly uh, cloudy one. So the PV. Um, Don't just ask the modelling. Did you do that on a previous real modelling or software modelling? Or? Software modelling. Yeah, so, so it, was a, it was a souped up version of most people that, if you're, I don't know if it's any assessors here, but um, a souped up version of the Accurate software. So it's software that's used for rating. Um, oh, I'll talk about the PV, yes, sorry. Oh, the PV, uh, the model of that. I think that was just, from memory, I think we just used something like PV1 yeah. um, to, 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 to do it. Yep, so. Um, but PV modeling is pretty, pretty simple to do, so. <laughs> oh dear! <laughs> yeah. So this is what we. So this is what actually uh, happened. Um, we were all a little bit surprised, <laughs> to say the least. Uh, you can see that enormous uh, uh, winter uh, energy uh, consumption that that that, that went on. And, and even during uh, the summer, you know, ev everything across the board was above what we uh, expected by a long, by a long way. Um, Did you do a, a graph and work out what it would be if, if it was an, an older style house without all the 10 or 8.2 <laughs> stars? Um, <laughs> well, a lot, a lot of it was down to, look, most of it was, nearly all of it was down to human um, behaviour. Look, it's actually interesting because the house itself has now been, it's been sold and the new owners are, are much more in tune with uh, how the house is operating. And we're about to put more of an equipment back into the house again. Monitor it. And monitor it again. And, and see when you've got uh, uh, an educated household in there, uh, the uh, difference uh, that it creates. Look, it's, it's and it's not, I don't want to be critical of, of the of the uh, the family that was in there. It's it's a really interesting exercise in that educational uh, requirement in in these homes. These homes can't operate. Um, now they don't won't just magically uh, provide fantastic savings without you interacting uh, with them. You really do need just like with a fuel efficient car. If you drive a fuel efficient car like it's um, like it's a Ferrari. You're not going to get the fuel efficiency that, that the manufacturers uh, claim. It's the same same with homes. So, so this is basically uh, broken down by the circuits. This is where the the uh, power of the energy uh, went. And as you can see, there it's dominated by the, the, that that HVAC uh, over, over winter, and it's um, and also the hot water system. Um, so get that one there. And you can see there the PV, the red line is, is, is the PV, and you can see naturally it's going to drop off over over June. So in, in summer it was it was keeping keeping pace with with the with the home. 
Uh, but it could it couldn't cope with the uh, the winter. I don't suppose you were measuring the water because I mean hot water like that to be able to go what you predict as opposed to what they use. I mean that, it sounds like they might have subconsciously trying to break this somehow too. And, and, and I'll get on to the yeah. few the few interesting things that they that they that they did. Um, oh look, I can talk about it uh, now. So um, one of the things they they could do with, with the HP, they they were very keen on. Um, natural uh, ventilation, so that all sounds well and good, but they like natural ventilation in winter. So they ran the heating system with the doors and the windows open. Yes. Um, <laughs> we all do laugh, I, I know, but that's what they did. They said, oh, well, that's, how we like, that's how we like the home, and it's such an efficient heating system, you know, it's great, it's, it's, it's heating the homes fine. Yeah, it really tied houses in the area, it's down to yeah. so I'll have to lay down these systems in there to get that fresh air. That regular air in the charge. Yeah, oh, we, we did have that. We did. No, we did. We, we, we did. The house was pretty. The house was pretty tight. We what was it? How was it six? 4.8. 4.8. Yeah. Uh, so we had it pressure tested. So it was 4.8 at, at 50 pascals pressure. Yeah. So it wasn't down to. It wasn't tight enough that it required um, uh, an active ventilation system um, like that. But it was a pretty. It was a pretty tight house. I mean, that's a lot of the average. The average in Victoria for, for new homes is around about 20 air changes uh, per hour of pressure. So we had it at 4.8. So it was, a, it was a pretty tight house. They placed it up. It would have performed. So, but I wonder if you would have got that same behavioural pattern if you had an HRV in there. Um, I think we probably would have, uh, to be absolutely yeah. honest with you. Okay. Yeah, I think we probably would have. Michael, did you, did you baseline the house without people? But I'm curious to know well, that's what the... its performance was as a passive house <laughs> yeah, well, before that's... you start throwing energy at it and before you start throwing people at it, which skews it again. Yeah, um, well the modelling um, didn't necessarily model it as, as a passive house, so uh, within that there was uh, heating and cooling requirements as the model thought was going to be uh, required. Um, if you say, did we model it? Did we monitor it in a free, in, in a, in a non-occupied, free-running state? Is that sort of thing? You're well, yes. Yeah, so, and in fact, did you design it with the right orientation? Oh yes. Oh yes. So it was all, it was all, it was all, it was all passively uh, designed. So it was all uh, orient. The house is orientated to, to, to the north. That's how it's achieved the 8.3 star rating. Because it had, it really was designed around passive, uh, passive house principles. Um, but having said that, and to be honest, if it had been my house, uh, I probably wouldn't have bothered. With, I might have had a split or something like that um, in, in the main living space. I probably wouldn't have bothered with it. It's a big ducted uh, heating and cooling system that was in the house. Um, I probably wouldn't have bothered with that. And being you know, an understanding of, of how these homes operate, would have would have been able to operate the homes in a much more passive uh, way. So, but we didn't actually model it after the house was built. Uh, the monitoring really began pretty much um, when the when the the household uh, moved in. We, we did a little bit of testing of the system, didn't we, Adam? But it, yeah, but it, it was on an awkward occupancy. Yeah, you know, being yeah. open on weekends. And um, yeah, because it was open. That's right. Because we had the, the house open as a display home, and that's always creates weird and wonderful um, uh, data as, as as well. The hot water service. What sort of heating did you find? Was it resistive heating or was it air compressor? Oh, it was, it, was, it, was, it was a, a flat panel, um, a twin, twin panel, flat panel solar system with, with um, storage. Yeah, the electric booster. Yeah, the electric uh, booster. Resistance booster or? Yes. Was it? I, I think it was, yeah. 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 Uh, look, and again, I think, uh, had, had we had our time, again, we had some issues with the, the, hot, the hot water system. Um, uh, had, had our time again, I think we probably might have put in a heat pump. Uh, so I don't know, what do you reckon, Adam? I yeah, think we probably would have done a, done a heat pump system yeah, yeah. rather than what, what was put in there. But uh, all these things were interesting learning uh, experiences about uh, what was going to uh, what was going to work and what, what didn't, uh, as well as expected. So certainly that was, we say, say, say poor ceiling. It wasn't really the poor ceiling of the house, it was poor ceiling of the occupants. Um, that, uh, an increase in um, in hot water over over winter. Well, again, we're going to get that reduced solar input during during the winter months, so you could expect a bit of an increase there. But I think, like I said, I think we did actually have some issues with the, the, the solar hot water system that, that was installed. Um, this one's an interesting one. You can see that spike there, and we scratched our heads, thinking, "What in the world is going on with this this sudden spike?" Um, 
that went, that went on. It was accidental usage. Uh, what, what, <laughs> what happened is the um, house had, uh, believe it or not, had an electric barbecue. Um, yeah, Christmas in July. They <coughs> left it on. <laughs> so it was happily heating up, it was creating a bit of an urban heat island effect. Uh, was, 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 going, was going on. Um, how long did they live on? Actually, I don't kind of remember now. It was on for a while. A couple of days. Yeah, but it, 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 it caused that, that spike uh, that shows up there uh, was from that accidental usage that, that went on. So, again, <laughs> we had some really interesting um, user behaviour uh, issues. But just to give you an idea of the daily use profit, so what it looked like uh, on, a, on, a, on a day to day, just uh, over the, the different uh, seasons, um, that was what a typical um, summer, uh, summer day uh, looked like, its energy consumption. Um, you can see as, as it gets uh, cooler, you get this uh, typical double, double hump. Um, and certainly in, in, in the winter data there, we get this, you get this double hump, so you get a, you get a uh, energy use in, in, in the morning, so they, people get they got up, you know, switch on the, the heating uh, system, then they all take off to, to work and school, late and so school. It, drop, it drops it yeah. late to school. Yeah. Well, they did actually have the, the two of the adults that were there actually were stay at home uh, as well, so um, yes, yeah, so that was uh, added, added to the, the energy load on that house. And then you've got that, that afternoon, evening. Um, a spike uh, as well. So this is pretty typical of, of, of most of most houses uh, that you look at um, will have this type of energy use uh, uh, profile. Um, the daily generation profile. Well, again, it's all, all we, we got all pretty uh, all pretty clean there. So it's what you expect, and of course, as 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 we move into the cool the cooler months, the um, the PV uh, generation. Um, uh, Narrowed and, 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 and lowered, but again, pretty typical of, of what you'd expect from um, a, P, a PV uh, system. Um, so we're pretty happy with the PV. So they they, they, they did they did fine. They did fine. We didn't have any issues uh, there. And sorry, that's all a bit that's all a bit messy. But you can see there that's overlaying the um, the use versus the the generation. And so we, that, uh, so again, during during um, the day. Uh, you yeah, know, the PV system was was in, uh, in the afternoon when the PV was at the bank, it was, it was being in demand fine, but it's these periods here and here where uh, the PV system couldn't, couldn't meet um, that, that demand. Um, that's, look, it's, it's quite a, quite a, they're just the sum of performance, just to, just to give you a bit of an, eye, an idea of, of what, uh, what it looked like on a typical um, on a typical uh, January that was for yeah January two thousand and twelve some of the summer performance of what, what we saw on the different days and you can see it going uh, up up and down on the on the various days and I think memory yeah so uh, because the, the thing with with this is when you um, overlay that with um, the maximum uh, temperatures. That will be experienced. We, we see that on, on those it's on those warmer days that uh, we're looking uh, for the higher uh, uh, the higher energy. So I think on this year they were actually away on holidays. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank goodness. <laughs> well, was the hot water system actually undersized then for the number of occupants? Look, um, there's a lot of boosting going on. Yeah, uh, it, it, but potentially it may have been. I I think we we probably had some other issues. Uh, with the, I don't know, Adam, do you, do you want to say anything about the hot? We did, thought it probably wasn't. It was it. probably so for a four-person household. Yeah, and every, like six, every, so. yeah, everything was modelled around a four-person mum, mum, dad, and two kids. So everything was modelled around that type of house profile. Um, so yeah, there, there was quite a lot of boosting that, that went that went on, and um, and again, I'm not sure whether the, the hot water system was actually performing um, at its optimum uh, level, whether it was. Was it a flat plate collector or was it? Yeah, flat plate. Oh. Yeah, 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 it wasn't a bad plate. A 315 litre tank? Oh, gee, oh, I can't remember now. It was around 300. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, Do you know anything about the usage habits of those kind of people that had the showers in the, in the evening so yeah. that they had to boost overnight or? I think they, yeah, they tended to and um, they had very long showers. 
teenage daughter, or oh, teenage, it was a niece uh, that was in there. She had the long the story about turning hot water on in the morning and waiting for it. Oh, yes. Yeah, thanks for reminding me, Adam. Yeah, there, there, there was. So, um, one of the things that they also uh, did is they, they wanted um, uh, hot water for their, uh, for, the, for, the, for the shower in the morning. And there was that lag. So they would, they would um, turn the shower on in, in the morning, and they'd go in and, and then uh, wander off and, and um, make a cup of coffee. Uh, so wait for the hot water to come, come through the, uh, the system. So, you know, it was chucking, chucking away, happily <laughs> popping out all this, not, not any wasting water, but, you know. Who paid the bills for this after you? Were well, there? look, that's, that's another interesting <laughs> story. That's, that's, that's another story, interesting yeah. story. Um, I can, I'm, I'm, I will jump around a little bit here. So with the bills, it's an interesting, the household, uh, they didn't, they never received a, an energy uh, bill. So uh, they, uh, all the bills actually went to, to, to Henley. But um, having said that, the house itself uh, was, when the PV system was installed, it, it, it copped, the, we were lucky enough to get the 66 cents a kilowatt hour feed, it, um, uh, feed in town. So even though the house didn't actually, um, you know, the amount of energy that the, the PV generated didn't actually meet the consumption of the house because we were getting 66 kilowatts for that time. You know, there was those times when the PVs were exported to the grid. That more than covered financially, more than covered um, the cost of, of the house. So the house was, we were miles in. I think at the time the house was sold, it was 3,000 bucks credit, something. Yeah, it was always in credit. It was always in credit. Always in credit. So, um, so it's, it's, an interesting, it's an interesting one for, on, the, on the human behavior side of things. Had they actually been receiving the bills and seen that they were in massive credit all the time, <laughs> would they be used more? <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah. yeah. The uh, statistic was solid that they actually were consuming more when they put in because they thought they generated more. So yeah. the psychological side. Yeah. So, or well, would they use less because they could then make lots of money out of it? Well, they, 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 they didn't get the money, so it's always... Yeah, well, if they were. They were. Yeah. Perhaps if they were, that would probably be different, but because it's always just rat, runs in credit, so you can't, you know, you weren't getting the money, it was just, there was a credit there, and of course they were always in credit. So, it's an interesting one with, with, with that, on whether the, uh, had they actually got the bills, <laughs> what would have happened? Would they have used even more, um, or, or would they have uh, um, pulled that up? I don't know. I think probably if they were getting the money, yeah, they probably would have uh, used, used less. Um, so that's just, um, yeah, just the, the matching up with the, the maximum outside temperatures and the um, and, and how the theories are going. Um, winter performance, uh, this is again the, uh, just a, a day um, of uh, a profile in July to, uh, on, and the various energy consumption. There you can see there. That's the PV, so you know, not um, not even getting close to uh, matching uh, matching uh, use um, uh, there. And we can see that it actually spiked. Down to, winter was our big our big problem uh, area, um, and somehow that's just a just a, a typical just a daily performance. Again, that's uh, showing that that double that double spike hump that you that, that you get. Uh, but again, it's fairly uh, fairly typical. Um, Daily performance. This is for December, just average over 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 the day. Michael. Yeah. That appears to be showing um, a peak of uh, less than 0.9 kilowatt hours um, from your six kilowatt yeah. system. So, what's your time scale again for your? This uh, <laughs> would have been in, in 30 minutes. Uh, right. Still. Yeah, so even even still, so, it yeah. seems well south of the rating of the system. I think it might be 15 minutes. I think it's probably not. I can't remember now. Um, it looks like it's certainly not half hour. Oh, it's not half an hour, is it? No, we're looking at there. Um, but it's averaged over the whole month. It might have. Let's go. It might have been 10 minutes. I can't actually remember. I can't actually remember. Um, yeah. Even at 15 minutes, it's pretty low. Yeah, it's pretty low. Look, the performance of one of the PBs is what we were, is what we were expecting. Um, but what I was going to talk about here, the interesting thing on this one is this thing, is this thing here. That's, that's, this is standby uh, power. 
that's, mm. that's, that's, that's going on um, in the housing. Now, there's been lots of talk about, about standby uh, and what does it actually contribute. Well, in this house, um, oh. And the fridge. Yeah, and, and, and actually, for that, we, uh, yeah, so this, in this back here, we excluded, we took the fridge out of the equation. So, but you're right, that, that open eye would have included. So Mark, just a question on the extra fridge in the garage. What circuit did that appear on? The on the garage circuit. Okay. Yeah. That, the garage didn't appear in most of these graphs? Or those oh, no, it should, should have been there. Yeah, okay. yeah. yeah. it should have been there. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, just so I'm uh, hoping that it's, so this is sort of just a, so, oh, there we go, it's also good. Um, so the standby actually, uh, represented 15% of the total energy use uh, for, for this house. So, uh, and there are lots of numbers out there. People say it's between three and, and 10. Well, we had 15% uh, that was uh, due to, that we determined was due to, to standby uh, power. So um, a lot of that, as you can see, uh, was coming, from not so much, not a great deal from the HVAC. It's actually interesting how much HVAC systems can actually uh, draw. We've, and other uh, projects where we're getting um, some HVAC systems that have a standby of 160 watts um, mm -hmm. in, in standby. Well, so that, that's uh, Michael, would that be included in the CRPs? I bet it isn't. In, 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 that's no, it's, uh, I, I don't think it is. I don't, I don't think it is. Oh, and look, it's an interesting one again with, with how the, the system was sized for the house because the HVAC industry um, doesn't really get uh, energy efficient homes. You know, they, they came along and basically say, oh, this is, you know, you've got a house of, of this size. Um, they plug, plug in their numbers into their little, onto their little spreadsheet and say, oh, you need, a, you need a system that's this big. And if you go to them and say, well, hang on, this house is uh, an eight-star home or a nine-star home. It's not, going to, it's not going to need that much. Or they say, oh, we can't do that. Um, our computer, computer says it has to be this big. Um, so it was, it was interesting that the HVAC industry uh, is, has, is slow to understand uh, how to resize systems depending on the, the, the thermal efficiency uh, of, of the house. Um, so, but yeah, so, and again what you can see with this, this, these, these spikes in the bedrooms and in the living and in the master, that is all the entertainment systems. That's the televisions and the, the Foxtel boxes and the uh, PlayStation and uh, everything else. Did you but, count them up? How many there were? Oh, there was a lot. We had, I think we had four or five televisions. Uh, two of them were big old fashion plasmas. Um, there were two, two or three Foxtel boxes. Three Foxtel boxes. Um, there was a home entertainment system. There, the kids had a uh, um, had a PlayStation uh, unit. Um, the one of the adults there, she was um, an elderly lady. She had uh, a Foxtel. She had a big old TV and a Foxtel unit in her, in her bedroom, and she used that a lot. Um, so I've actually been in a house that's had 16 PowerPoints plugged in. 16. Yeah, so there's laughter, there's a bit of laughter, but this is actually a normal. It is, house. and look, I know. I know <laughs> it's scary. Yeah. And, 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 I, and I know households that have got. You know, Nine or ten televisions. You know, you've got two televisions outside, and you've got three fridges. Yeah, it's yeah. I'm, I'm intrigued that the standby in some of those areas is varying so much over the year. I mean, standby, I would have expected to be more consistent. Yeah, look, I say, it, like I said, some of it, um, it'll, it'll, it'll be our best guess. Uh, it, it's hard to determine exactly what is what is it, what is standby. Um, so you know, you, we tend to look at the, the, the overnight consumption and thinking, well, that's probably it when we see a fairly steady, when we see a fairly steady. But it, but it's it's it's, 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 a, it's a, it can be a hard one to to um, pin to pin down. If you've got teenagers in the house, that's not standby. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is three o'clock in the morning. That's somebody on the computer. This <laughs> yeah. is sort of a bit a bit before the days of. I should say it's not that long ago, but. Um, I can't remember how many computers they had, but I don't think we, it was sort of prior to the iPad smartphone revolution. Um, but look, one of the other things that's really interesting um, here, with the, again, this is us trying to get a bit of a feel uh, for uh, the different circuits and, and how much uh, was actually, of, the, of their total consumption, how much was standby and how much was actual, actual the thing was doing something. Um, 
And it's always an interesting one because with entertainment appliances and things like DVD players and things like uh, that, they spend around about 90% of their time, their, or 90% of their energy consumption is standby uh, energy consumption. So they only spend 10% of their total energy consumption is actually them doing something. Yeah. How did you actually measure your standby? <coughs> Look, it was like I said, it was the best, it was the best guess. Uh, so we didn't act data wasn't actually specifically no, no. So we didn't actually specifically know that oh, this this device is actually off. So we tried to determine it from I think what we from memory um, what we did is we looked at the overnight. We looked at their at, at each circuit's um, lowest consumption. Um, so it's you know, in in a in a fifteen minute period what its lowest uh, consumption was that tended to be overnight and said okay that's and and we only targeted those those circuits that had devices that would have standby power on them and said, okay, that's the standby power that we're, that we're, that we're seeing on that particular uh, circuit. Because we had so many, so many circuits in the house, a lot of the, the things um, were, you know, the entertainment, so all, all the entertainment stuff really was on one circuit. And um, so we were able to get a relatively good idea, but it, it still was, nonetheless, it still was our best, our, our best guess. But it's, it's interesting to see, you know, these, <coughs> The amount of time some of these in these areas uh, that the vast majority of the time there's, there's just sitting in standby is, is, is that's what the draw uh, is and the HVAC is, 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 is not and of course other things that uh, were able to be switched off completely you don't get any standby uh, on them uh, at, at all so no smart switches or anything no oh we we had a um, the house had a um, what do I call it the good night a good night switch or a so it, it basically there was a kill switch that you could if they left for the day or they they could um, do that and it would kill power to all non-essential uh, circuits. So it would keep the fridge going and I think it had some other device. So we had one to, to the washer. Yeah, had one for that. So basically we had a, a system that was able to kill power to. Did they use it? No. <laughs> did you tell them? They did. They did know about it. They did know about it, but they didn't use it. Um, nor did they actually use the the, the so the in-home display unit that I talked about earlier. They didn't use that either. Uh, so they we had some issues again with it's a bit again. Look, it's the whole thing with uh, this was fairly um, at the time that it was put in. In-home display systems were almost unheard of. So we had to create one from scratch, and uh, it was a little bit glitchy, uh, I have to say. And they got a little bit jack of it and they turned the thing off. Actually, I think they put their family photos on it. Um, <laughs> and <laughs> that family photo right around it. So um, there were some technical issues uh, there, but they didn't really use the, the, the uh, in-home space system either. The, so, the great yeah. water system, um, was what was going on there? I don't know. I, don't, I think we had a faulty pump, didn't we? Or something, yeah. Yeah, 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 that's right. Um, yeah. So it probably really shouldn't be a standby, but it was a fault. It was a faulty. It was a faulty pump. That uh, it was a flow. There wasn't a one-way flow. That's right. Control. Yeah. yeah. Some of these things we discovered as as we were looking at the data, and we're thinking, what's going on there? <laughs> <laughs> and would go out, and all, Adam would go out and fiddle around with it and say, why it, is it doing that? Um, and we try and fix them as 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 we could. But it's one of the nice things about having uh, uh, live. Uh, live data is you, at least you can uh, monitor these things and thinking that doesn't look right um, and do and try and do something um, about it. Um, so I'll just, oh, uh, this is just again um, just on PV performance, just to, uh, I mentioned this a little bit uh, before, just how, how you know, it, it's, uh, we saw those graphs before which is lovely you know, lovely parabolic uh, curves, but of course PV um, performance does go does go up and down um, depending on our climatic um, conditions. So this is just like for January um, each day, and this is just mapped with the amount of sunshine hours that were recorded uh, on on those days. And you can see you get, you get a pretty pretty good correlation there between when the sun's out, and the PVs are, are doing what they're meant to do, and, and when and when it's and when it's cloudy. Uh, they don't perform as as, as well. So, um, and and this is just another way of, of looking at it too. Um, I don't know whether people know uh, about this octus uh, rating. That's basically uh, amount of cloudiness um, in the sky. So eight eight there means um, 
total uh, cloud cover, and, and zero means completely uh, cloud-free um, sky. So again, this is for a, a winter period, so we can see you know, lots of, and it's measured, it's, it's, it's just a visual thing that the Bureau does, and they do it at 9 a.m. and 3 p.m. Um, so these are, the, these are the recordings uh, over this period um, in, in July, so we can see lots of, lots of, cloudy, lots of cloudy days um, there, and, uh, and again, when you map the PV uh, generation over the top, you, you hardly be surprising, but it's good to see that you do get this, this type of correlation. So on the days where we had fairly uh, low cloud, uh, that's, when, that's when the PV is, is performing um, at, its, at its best. So um, it's just uh, um, always interesting to know that, that you know, PV performance is going to be affected by these various uh, climatic conditions. Um, did we achieve zero emission? Well, you can probably guess the answer um, uh, to this. Uh, <laughs> we, 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 we didn't. Uh, however, having, having said that, we, we, didn't, we, we didn't do too bad, uh, considering um, the, the family that we were up against. So the house still did produce around about 71% of, of the home's uh, energy requirements, and those energy requirements were high. So um, we, didn't do, we didn't do too bad. Uh, if we got rid of the HVAC system, uh, we would have been at about 108% uh, of the energy requirement. And if we got, and if we got rid of the hot water system, you'd be at about 172. So those those two systems, the HVAC and, and the hot water system, were our um, at the, that uh, at Achilles heel for for us. Um, so most of this I've brought really uh, I, I really have already uh, talked about during during the discussion, but. Um, Really, uh, if we had higher household numbers, and we had more people in the home than, 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 than we thought, uh, a much higher number of appliances than, than, than what we we modelled, things like multiple t uh, tele television and stuff like uh, Reduced use of the airlock, I didn't, I didn't discuss this. The house uh, was designed, so as you came in, into the house, it had uh, an airlock. So it had a second, another door um, that led into the main open plan, so open plan home. So there's a main door, there's another door that led into um, the main uh, living space. Now the idea with it, with airlocks is you keep the airlock closed, and uh, as you're going in and out of the house, you don't lose that conditioned uh, air. They chopped it open, um, <laughs> so um, so you know, so we didn't we didn't get that air airlock uh, effect. Lots of opening and closing of, of, of windows, or lots of opening of windows. Um, we had, had some quite sophisticated uh, shading systems. We had uh, vertical uh, shading devices that, went, you know, that you could wind down to shade the windows. We had an extendable uh, awning system that was over the, uh, the alfresco uh, area. The feedback we got from them, they really didn't use those systems all that, uh, all that much. They weren't automatic. No, they weren't on it. We, 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 we purposely wanted to avoid having automatic systems. I mean, automatic systems are, uh, there's just more things to go wrong, and you know, they may need power, of course. So we purposely avoided having automated systems, but um, yeah, <laughs> that's not a pretty good idea. We had that accidental consumption that I, I, I talked about. They really didn't look at, at the monitoring system that was in the home. Um, the lack of Energy bill information. Don't know what those are said. Don't know what the impact might have been of that. Have they actually seen their, their their bills? And we did have a cloudy summer, which means that the the, the PVs weren't quite at their at their peak performance, but they were pretty close. Um, this is not from the house. I was just going to quickly uh, talk about this uh, as well. So this is a this is a completely different study um, that that we've that we've done. Um, we did a uh, we did a large study on um, the five star um, uh, rating of homes. And we're basically looking at have homes actually achieved uh, the, have the, the high star rated homes actually achieved the energy savings that we expected from lower star rated homes. Um, and one of the things we found out from that particular study uh, was that in, in winter, yep, we're all okay, uh, but in summer. We weren't really, see, we were seeing often in the highest star rated homes, believe it or not, we were seeing higher energy consumption in, in summer than in, in lower star rated homes. So, three or four, we had four star rated homes, we were using less energy in summer than a five or six star rated home. And we were there again, scratching our heads, thinking, what is going on? And most of it was being driven by air conditioning 
uh, consumption. Now, uh, one of the, the things that we, we thought is, go, is going on there, the, the modeling software, the, the NetHERS software that's used to rate homes, particularly in, in summer, assumed a certain amount of natural ventilation is, is going on. So it's built in, into the program and the program assumes that it's going to, to happen. But of course, natural ventilation requires human interaction and you, know, you, you need somebody in the house to, winter's not so bad because basically get the house sealed up. That's pretty much what the, system, the model says how the house is going to, to operate. So but sorry, in, Mike, is this night purging or is this? So this is basically night purging. So the software assumes that a certain amount of night purging and when, when it is cooler is, is, going to, is going to occur. So there is, there is some, some allowance for natural ventilation in, in, in the software. Yeah. I could also tell you the former energy rater that, the, that you paid a lot more attention as an energy rater to the winter performance and summer performance because that's where you got the maximum bang for your buck. Yeah. So, yeah. so yeah. if you had a choice of doing stuff, you would, you would go in and do the stuff on the winter performance because it was so yeah. much easier to achieve yeah. the software. Yeah, and absolutely. And, and, and so and, and typically with our, especially here in, in, in Victoria, you know, we are, we, we, we do, we, you know, we do out there. Once we do lots of insulation and, and stuff like that. So we've got lots of ways to hold that heat in. But of course, in summer, that means that heat will be held in into the house. Yeah. Um, and, and, and night purging is much to try and <coughs> deal with that. Um, but our, our, our guess was that this is not really going on. It's a human behaviour thing. So we did a little study of, of four homes. This is just one of them. And it's just, it's just interesting um, data to have, a, to have a look at. Um, Michael? Yeah. Was there any um, air quality monitoring system? No. 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 I'd be really keen to get back in and do the air, uh, the air monitoring, um, though, but no, there, there, there wasn't. Um, so what you see here, it's a little bit, it's a little, it, it takes a little bit of time to get, to get your head around uh, what this, this graph is actually uh, uh, representing, where we basically put sensors on, um, on four doors or windows. We asked the household, now what, what, what doors or windows do you open to get your natural ventilation? And we put sensors um, on, on each of those. And basically, um, the, the height, of the, the sticks here represents how many of those openings are uh, in, 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 a, in a half hour period. How many of them are actually open? So when they're down, when they're down low, this this means that just just one's open. That's that's two. That's that's um, three. So we've got this over there. We've pretty much got them, them all open. And and the width is the amount of time that they that they spend uh, open. So what you can see here really is that. The windows and the doors are really not spending a great deal of time open. In fact, what we found from these homes here is that about 95, 96% of the time, windows were closed um, in, in the homes. And this was just over a summer, uh, a summer period. Um, and when we t put over the top of, of that, the inside and the outside temperature. So the outside temperature is, is a lighter coloured line um, there. And, and the, the uh, inside temperature is, is the darker line there. And you can see, you know, naturally, as you expect, outside temperature is going up and down as it goes from uh, daytime to nighttime. So it cools off down the night. You can see here that's 20 degrees. So you can see here we get some nice cool temperatures uh, here. Um, and really, these are the points where this, this is the night purging opportunity um, that exists. So this is where we've got you know, our light blue line is below our dark blue line. So this is where you've got the your opportunity to get in some cool air um, from outside, but as you can see, we don't have any we don't have any windows open, and it was all the four homes that we looked at. This was this was the same sort of pattern that we saw. We saw a lot of opportunities for overnight cooling not really being taken uh, advantage of, and look, there could be a whole lot of reasons uh, for this. A lot around security and stuff like that that people don't like leaving their windows open um, at at night time. But the interesting thing is that of course that the software um, and for, for homes to be to perform uh, well passively, they do in summer they do require some of this uh, uh, outside cooling. It's interesting too to note here um, that this, this when they did it, this period here where the windows were open for the for the most time, um, the outside temperature is actually warmer um, than the inside temperature. So they were actually bringing in hot air from from outside um, here. And of course, when we look at their uh, air conditioning uh, consumption, that's the air conditioning um, circuit. You can see that's pretty much how they maintain internal uh, temperature comfort was by shoving on, shoving on the air conditioner um, at these points here to try and bring the, the, the house 
back into um, a comfortable uh, estate. So it's just interesting to look at these types of human behaviour um, aspects and really it comes back to getting that education out there to people say how people should uh, operate uh, their homes. Um, now, do people know about this, this yeah. character? So he's a Garden in Australia um, uh, presenter and um, he's built himself a, um, a, a ten star house over in Perth which is all wired up and, and modern and, um, and he's got uh, a very, very good uh, website and um, how am I doing on time by the way? Where's... Am I fine? Because yeah. um, hopefully uh, it's got... He came out here and he was keen to see the zero emission home and so he came out um, just a few months ago and did a video uh, for, of, of the house. Um, so myself and Adam, we both got roped into uh, being uh, movie stars. So I thought it was um, worthwhile just playing, hopefully the video will, will work, uh, play, playing the video um, because it gives you a, a good uh, a view of what the house, what the house actually uh, looks, looks like. Um, and it's got me babbling on. Um, well, and Adam, he babbles on too. Don't we, don't we, Adam? Indeed. Yeah, indeed. <laughs> so hopefully, let's just see if it'll, if it'll, if it'll work. Looks like it's going to be. Josh Bird, and for the last couple of years I've been working on my own high performance sustainable housing project near Fremantle in WA. His website's really the good, it's got really high professional videos and that he's done on it. So it's a strong belief that there is a better way that we can be designing and building our homes. Now that the houses have been completed and are gathering data that shows that they work, I've set myself a new challenge. I'm heading off on a groundbreaking national research tour, visiting the very best affordable, high-performance housing projects that I can find, and bringing them together in one place for the very first time. I want to see if they truly are a realistic and affordable option for the mainstream housing market in Australia. And if they are, I want to know what's holding them back. This is Josh's house, Star Performance. called the Zero Emissions House, which is about 30 k's to the north of Melbourne in an outer suburb. And it's a project that I've wanted to see for some time and I'm really looking forward to it. I reckon Melbourne is a great place to start my tour because it's under real pressure from rapidly increasing population and sprawling urban development. With this in mind, to me, energy efficient housing design should be a priority. The home I'm visiting is the result of a collaborative project between Henley Property Group, the CSIRO and Delphin and Lease and was completed in 2010. It ticks the boxes to be part of my Star Performers research tour because the project's aim was to design and build an affordable and accessible high performance home for the mainstream market and, importantly, monitor it and collect data to prove that it works. <laughs> Well, <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> with the new ones. <laughs> I like it, I should just see a decent front yard landscape, which always rocks my boat. <laughs> Michael. Hi, Josh. How are you? Nice to meet you. Come here. Come here. Thank you. It's great to finally visit. Oh, come here. I want to show you around. What a beautiful home. Michael and his wife Carol are the new owners of the house. They've been living here for about a year and are settling in nicely. So how are you finding it living here? Oh, we just love it. It's fantastic. It's warm in the winter, it's cool in the summer, it's quiet, it's easy to live in. It's just a really nice place to go. Yeah, it's once nice you've uh, been in a solar passive home, there's no going back, is there? Oh, it's, it's really fantastic. Solar passive design is the golden rule when looking to achieve <coughs> high performance, energy efficient home in southern Australian climates. And this is reflected in this four bedroom, two bathroom family home. What this means 
is the orientation of the home makes use of our number one energy resource, the sun. This house uses the sun by having all living areas facing north, with windows positioned to allow light and warmth in, which is then retained by the insulated slab, walls, ceiling and double glazing. There's also clever block out screens and a motorised awning for summer shading, complemented by a high energy efficient and zoned ducted reverse cycle air conditioning system. The 8 star rated home is also equipped with energy efficient lighting and appliances and a high efficiency solar hot water system. In fact, everything in the home runs on electricity, which is completely offset by its 6 kilowatt grid connected solar power system. The zero emission house, which by definition means the home generates more energy than it uses over the course of the year, also has rainwater tanks that feed the toilets and garden taps, and a grey water diversion system for garden irrigation. I think this is a standout example, and I'm interested to hear if it's cheap to run. Well this house here has no energy bills uh, whatsoever, so that two or three thousand dollars that a, a typical household would have to spend on their uh, electricity and gas bills, this house has zero. In fact, they're actually in credits. So do you think if the average home buyer knew the money they could save by having a high performance home, that they'd be asking for that? Yeah, look, I think that is true. And of course, electricity prices and energy prices are already going in one direction. Um, so those savings are going to get bigger and bigger uh, each year. Now, I think there's a lack of understanding in the community about what is actually... That's the airlock area. Right from the start, that was our primary aim, was to demonstrate that this is quite feasible, quite doable, affordable, and you can achieve it. <coughs> I think when people come to this house, they're expecting straw bales, mud bricks, and, you know, something that looks a little bit sort of kooky. They see this house and they go, wow, it's a really nice house. It's slick. I'd love to live in this house. So I think they're quite surprised when they see what a zero energy house really looks like. So I think there's a little bit of market education required. And the other factor is, you know, the builders need a little bit of probably help getting up to speed with what's required. It's not rocket science, but there's a couple of little details that need to be ticked off as you go through design and construction. And one of the classics is air tightness. And, you know, to, to make a zero energy home in this climate, you can't be losing all that conditioned air to the environment through leaky windows and the like, and that's something that often gets overlooked. Air tightness is a concept that we don't hear much about in the warmer climate regions of Australia, but it makes complete sense, especially in a place like Melbourne, where you have to contend with bitterly cold winters and you don't want to lose warmth. But one of the things I'm most interested in is occupant behaviour. How does the way that people live in a home affect the performance? Homes do not operate uh, in isolation. They do need interaction with the, the, the occupants. They, people they need to know how to ventilate the home, particularly in summer, you know, the natural ventilation, getting that overnight cooling of, of, of the home. Um, and if you don't do that, the home is going to struggle to achieve what it's truly capable uh, of. So it is really important for, uh, for people to get that understanding, that education uh, about how to operate their home effectively. And it's going to be their biggest purchase that they're ever going to make Working out how to operate it correctly and efficiently is really a key thing. And it's probably, as like I say, really that missing part of the jigsaw about how do we educate people in the operation of their homes. The Zero Emission House has gathered some great experience and data in terms of occupant behaviour. The home went through a test phase when first completed and a large family moved in and pretty much ignored the tips to attain the best operational performance. But the results were compelling had a family living in the house that pushed it hard for a period of uh, around about two years. And um, as hard as the house was driven, um, it always returned a credit on our uh, you know, electricity bill. So you say that the, the people who were living here during that test phase, they drove it hard, that's an interesting term. Um, mm -hmm. How hard did they drive it? What, what do you mean by that? Well, going back to the car analogy, you know, like you can give someone an energy, a fuel efficient car or a very thirsty car. You can drive a thirsty car easily and extend its fuel economy, but it's still going to be higher than that fuel efficient car, even if it was driven hard. So we've got a very fuel efficient house. They drove it hard, but it was still fuel efficient. At the wheel now driving the home is of course Michael and his wife Carol. And they're keen to see what it can really achieve. But they're also finding that purely living in the home is already having an interesting impact on their family and friends. Something that's been interesting that's happened, we've had friends come out and visit it 
and they've loved the house. We've spent a lot of time here. They've enjoyed being in it. The most interesting thing is that we've been to lunches and dinners later on with those same friends, and they say, oh, tell everybody about your house. And we go, oh, good. No, they're not interested. Oh, yes, yes, you should tell them about it. And it's quite interesting. Everybody is, is engaged in the conversation. Yeah, there is a general interest, but I think that people feel that they can't access it in some way. It's, it's just a great way to live. It's where people ought to be. It's all, you know, what we should be, all be doing. I think um, if we could uh, plant some seeds of, you know, I think best in class, if you like, sort of examples of what needs to be done, then the market gets to see that and people get to move into those little communities and, and actually the feedback will be, hey, this is fantastic. So it's like planting the seeds in different areas, I guess, and building up a little bit of a groundswell of momentum. I think then uh, everyone will move together. I think what the biggest thing to do would be uh, education. I think uh, education of the buying public. I think if they became aware of what is actually possible, what is actually doable, they would start demanding from, from the building industry. And I think then the industry would just naturally follow. The, the industry is out there, it will deliver what the client wants. I reckon that's a lovely home and clearly a very nice place to live, going by Michael's enthusiasm. I think we've seen that there's nothing particularly difficult, expensive or complicated about this high performance zero emissions house. But it does leave me asking, why aren't there more of it? I'll be following the performance of the zero emission house over the next 12 months as part of my research. So that gives you a bit of a... A little Josh's bit of a tail look of what the house uh, looks like. That was only done a few, um, a beautiful Facebook sunny day, of course. Uh, so uh, but um, and this this series of videos is going to. Josh's they've house actually got a uh, house up in um, Sydney. One that's now available on, on, uh, on the side of the website. Josh's house got a lot of videos and it's been wide up to the yeah, that's, that's a really interesting house um, up there. <laughs>
I've got to be interested in how that ends up. The couple that bought it in got a fantastic deal. Yeah. <laughs> 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 they sold it for like, well done then. But did, you, did you guys give them a budget then or something, or how did you manage that? Like how, what, what basically ran up the specification of the actual home and what you could do with it? For, for the actual yeah, home? Initial build. Building the house. Initial build, was it? So did you give them a specification, did you give them a budget, or how did you give driver? Uh, when we built the house originally, well, yeah, did you specify all? The, yeah, we did. So we worked very closely uh, with with Hanley. So also with the intention of managing your budget. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the the, the idea was, um, as Adam says, it was about maybe fifteen percent. Most a lot of that went in things like at, at the time we built it. Things like timber, double glazed windows were very very expensive. So there were certain things on there, and the PV system at the time was a very you know, that cost a lot. So and a lot of those costs have now come have now come down. So the the whole intent was really to keep the build cost around about the three hundred for the house about the three hundred k mark. Uh, so it was a more it was it was a bit of a premium. So from Henley's range, it was probably one of their premium uh, homes that they would that they would have. But the whole idea was to try and keep the cost uh, relatively close to what you would go if you're building another stock standard project home premium home. I would well, imagine that your brief was that you wanted to show that this had good ROI of the whole building. And yeah. So therefore, you would have had a budget. You would have put your purpose and assume you yeah. some post mortem on that. Yep. And then basically, so that was from what you opened up with. That's the demonstration you want to show yep. that it's actually economically. Yeah, that's right. That's uh, right. That's right. Yeah. So, yeah. so yeah. Yeah. Then that's that's the approach, and that's why a lot of stuff is is a, so the house itself. It's just a brick. It's a brick veneer house on a on a insulated concrete slab. So there's nothing very special uh, about the way the house was built. We just paid more to be up insulation levels. We paid careful attention to the ceiling um, of of the house. So the expensive things really were things like the double glazing. You now we, we had a pretty much an off the shelf hot water system. The PV system was just. So my, my, my experience, people have trouble understanding the ROI. So there's numbers of figures they'll go, yeah. they don't really know. Yeah. Nice yeah. house. Even the agents now say, nice house. You know, That's I, right. I, I just and look, agents say the solar that actually doesn't actually increase the value and of the house. You know, I, 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 I sometimes play games. So sometimes when I see a house in my area, I live out in, in Blackburn, and so there's a few um, nice ish houses out, out there. And when, when some of the more uh, better design homes pop onto the market, I love going there and just seeing <coughs> how the poor old real estate agents uh, sell it out, and they get they get so much stuff confused, and they'll get orientation uh, muddled up, and they'll, they'll get thermal thermal mass uh, thermal mass and insulation. <coughs> they constantly get get it get it round the wrong way. Um, so it's it's interesting in in that from the real estate agent's point of view, you know, they 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 really uh, don't know how to sell these homes, and then the builders, you know, again. Um, not necessarily want to pick on volume builders, but you know, most people, the vast majority of people, when they go to build and buy a new uh, house, they're going to build a new house. It's going to be through a volume builder. They're going to go out to these estates, and they're, going, they're not going to employ an architect. It's about five percent of, of home, probably less, are actually architect designed. Um, I've got probably not one to one. Most of the time, people talk to the salesperson uh, at the display home. It's all decided there, there and then. And the first time they actually ever see the builder is when the house is actually under construction and started construction on their site. All the time I spend in, in going into, into the, um, the office, uh, you know, it's all to the, the admin people and the sales people and, and, and the, uh, the finance people. And you never actually speak to an actual builder um, until the house is actually, until they lay the, lay the slab uh, on, on, on the ground. And, I, and I've, I've built my own house just, just recently and I had to do lots of, of hand-holding um, with, with the builder there to ensure that uh, you know I was getting um, what I what I was what I was after. So I've got a, my home's about a seven and a half star, but it was interesting. I put in things like double glazing, and uh, I remember getting a um, a phone call from from the builder or from the finance people saying, "Oh, great news! Great news! Um, we're able to reduce the amount of insulation." In your home, because you've got a double glaze in there, you only need to achieve six stars. So we, we, you can take out some of the insulation because you've got the double glaze in. And you, you're missing the point. <laughs> that, that is actually the trouble. I, mean, I, I think you're back at constructability from building. That's what they actually focus on. When you yeah. when you actually specify things, they always go. I had this this morning when I had some material talking about. Oh, what's the easiest way of doing? It? So the, 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 the trade people always think the easiest way of doing it rather than the actual. And uh, and. Uh, and the sales people in, in, in they're, 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 most people are driven by the, the dollars. So you know, what's, the, what's the what's the cheapest house I can get? Oh, I want a house of X number of square meters. What's the cheapest house I can get for? 
Michael, That's can I challenge one aspect of your presentation? Yeah, yeah sure, that, sure. Um, you focus pretty much on temperature. The nice thing about temperature is you can actually quantify it and record it, mm. and it, it's pretty straightforward. Um, what I've discovered, though, in my place is that temperature and comfort are not the same thing. Yeah, yeah. And the amount of you know, a pleasant uh, breeze coming through the house on a summer evening going into night purging yep. um, is delightful. Yeah. Um, even though it's going to be a bit warmer. Um, a, uh, a draft in winter is murder, even if the yeah. temperature is actually a lot higher. So temperature and comfort are not the same thing. No. You've shown temperature, which I understand that you can measure that. Can measure comfort yeah. requires people, yeah. and some of them are variable, as you've discovered. Yeah. Yeah. But is there any way to go to that next step and actually go from temperature, which is not comfort, to actually comfort? Yeah, look, it's, it's, a, really good, it's a really good question. <laughs> um, and it, it's one that we have... Um, Right to particularly um, how can we quantify because a lot of it is just it's a personal opinion you know people you, you're sure. quite right you know and if, even if you've just got ceiling fans going to the, the the temperature might be a bit higher but if you've got that breeze uh, it's it's going to but feel more Na natural modelling does take comfort into account that's 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 what the assumptions are in the natural but the, stuff the comfort that. the comfort it takes into account is is a, is a relationship between Humidity and temperature. Yeah, yeah. and there's a, a standardised no, and, and, and cross ventilation. Yeah. And, and, and not, yeah. but so, so, so it's not. But it's an assumed amount. Yeah. Um, but it's a really interesting. I mean, we've talked about you know, could we put anemometers? But, but you, the problem is to get to get breezes there, you're going to have the anemometers you know, hanging in the middle of a bloody living room. And just, you know, the first thing with refrigeration and conditioning is that you've got this bubble. Like you might go from 20 degrees to 25. You can go do a survey. You've got relative humidity. You've got the psychometric yeah. charts. You've got all different things. It's such a very subjective thing. You it is. It's, 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 a it's, number it's, of it. I'd love to yeah. come up with an answer for it, but and uh, it's. It's it's a really tricky book because you're absolutely right. It it, it it's, it's very much uh, comfort is, is very much a personal uh, thing and it's a really hard one. To, it's a really hard one to measure. I'll just comment on that. I've just started to work with a friend where I've got her house upgraded quite a few stars by getting uh, echo master to come in and, and oh yeah 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 the full um, yep. full retrofit on the place and the chaps in the next door to me put PVs on our roof and give her some control over her energy use and stuff. But what was interesting is the first thing she said was how much more pleasant it was because it was so much more still. Yep. So you think about the temperature, she said it was much more still and much quieter. Yeah. She was in Alpha Park and she used to say, so that the noise felt as if it needs to be an issue. But that was, I thought, quite fascinating. She was like, look, bugger the fact that I'm now, you know, gone green, et cetera, et cetera, which she's quite pleased with. But she was really emphatic about other two things that stood out. Yeah. Look, it's interesting. One of the things that have been talked about, and I sort of mentioned a little bit in the video there, you know, the how to market these houses, you know, and it's really more marketing on their, their they're, they're comfortable homes to live in. They have more little, but you're going to be your job. You listen to Michael, the new owner, and, and it's those, it's those um, personal things. You know, it's comfortable. It's it's nice to live in. It feels it feels nice, nice and warm. You know, I feel really good. It's a nice, happy space to be. All those sorts of your emotive um, parts is is really rather than saying, oh well, it's got this, it's got the star rating of this, and it's got thermal mass, you know, it's got thermal performance of this and that, and the home's going to be maintained within this temperature band and blah blah blah. People go, oh, I don't know what you're talking about there. I, all I want to know is, is this a this is a really nice home um, to live in. Yeah. Following on the uh, press of heating and cooling, did you have reversing sort of heating and cooling so No. Well, that's I've installed those, and like the air breeze operates pretty well the same way. Yeah, yeah. So Look, you better comfort uh, yeah. Uh, and, and again, I think if you were probably uh, again, this was designed for the mass market. Um, so again, I think again, you look at homes if people that are knowledgeable in this space, they're going to probably go down the path of having things like ceiling fans uh, or having a very a much smaller uh, heating cooling uh, system, whether it's just a, like a little, in this house, maybe just a single split in, in the main living space, and that probably would have been fine. Um, so things like that. But part of, part of the, the rationale behind the house was that we wanted to try and build a house that appealed to that, that mass house buying public. So people would go in to say, oh yeah, it's just like that. It's like the other display home I, I looked at uh, next, next door. It's got it's got my ducted heating system that I that I that I want. Um, it's got everything else. It's got my ensuite. It's got my other bathroom. So that was the the idea was to try and have a home that is going to be highly marketable to to that 
mum, the mum and mum and dad buyers out there. So it, 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 it probably wouldn't be the house that somebody that is um, specifically after a passive design home would actually des uh, design necessarily. Oh, question probably more random. How many people care about orientation when you're buying or building a house? Because it, it's something I'm so passionate about. I can't yeah. understand why so many houses I see are going up. And yeah. And I think people that understand yeah. obviously want it. Um, I don't, don't know. And yeah, <laughs> so I think the challenge for, for a builder like us is to actually get our sales people to really convey mm -hmm. the message of why it's important yeah. and to try and help them build a comfortable house. So it's not just comfort, it's actually, yeah. well, oh, it's comfort, it's, it's enjoying that. It's enjoying it's, it's, it's like that. It's 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 Look, it's really interesting on, on that aspect of orientation, that, that other study that I did on looking at just we took um, 400 uh, homes, just random homes across. Australia that have been built in the last eight years or so, and did did uh, analysis on me. And one of the things that we looked at was orientation. We looked at how have the windows been uh, positioned. Uh, did we see any change in you know the percentage of windows on each orientation of the home? We found virtually no change. We found about that evenly spread on on each orientation. And, and again, it, it's it's a it comes from uh, the the volume home builders, they want they design homes that are basically going to fit on any block on any orientation. Um, and so what we, we saw, in fact, Victoria, believe it or not, it's, it's, it's uh, on, on the high star rated homes, we actually found a slight increase in the amount of glazing that was facing west. Um, yeah. There you go. But, uh, but, but, but virtually we saw that orientation, so the, the, the mechanisms that the builders were using to achieve the rating, orientation and, and glazing, they reduced the glazing area, so the, the amount of glazing in the home came came down um, by about 20%. Um, but the orientation didn't change a lot. Just, just, just coming back to that point about comfort, um, uh, uh, one of the big factors that hasn't been talked about a lot, so it's really just touched on it, is, is humidity. Mm. I, think the, I think the ideal humidity is between 40 and 60 percent. Yeah, that's about right. Yeah. So if you if you've got a situation where you've got low humidity, you then opens up the opportunity for evaporating mm -hmm. air conditioning, mm -hmm. which is obviously a lot cheaper. Mm -hmm. than yeah. If it runs up the other side, you've got the opportunity to, to dehumidify, mm -hmm. and perhaps um, you know create you know get the water from that somehow. Yeah. Yes, harvest the water, look, that kind of thing. I don't know how much work we've done around that. Look, we haven't done very much. I mean, look, I'm, I'm a, you know, evaporative cooling is, is works really effective in, in certain climates. It's, it's pretty effective. I've certainly got it in, in my place. I think in Melbourne, the climate, it works well. Um, it's not for everybody. I, I, the, the, they've got a lot, lot better than you know, the old swampies that they used to be. They're, they're, and if you, again, if you know how to operate those systems correctly, uh, they, they work very effectively. Um, and, uh, and when you do have high humidity, uh, those days you do occasionally. Again, understanding that uh, running uh, it with the water pumps going on an evaporative system is not going to help your situation, and perhaps just running it without the pumps on is going to be the best, and you'll just get that then that cooling breeze passing through, through the house rather than um, pumping more humidity uh, in, into the home. So. Yeah, I'm, I'm, it doesn't work in all climates, of course. So in, in, the, in the tropics, it's uh, evaporative cooling is not it's not going to work. Um, but certainly in, in, in dry climates in, in Melbourne, yeah, I think it's pretty effective. And then, uh, and the other thing you mentioned was the opportunity for dragging um, air out from the atmosphere at certain opportune opportune, yeah. opportune times. And then the other thing you consider there is dew point. So <laughs> they don't want to be uh, yeah. creating problems. For yeah, look, it's an interesting. So you talk you talk to some people, some some. Material manufacturers and they get concerned about um, moisture inside cavities and stuff like that, and rotting, you know, rotting timbers and and, 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 and causing mould and mildew, which comes back to you know, like indoor air quality issues uh, potentially. So um, there it is. It, it is. It is a bit of a uh, careful. You know, it's a difficult uh, space, but yeah. Um, Excuse me. Um, we'll take another two questions, and then uh, we can have an informal yeah. uh, question answer session. So, so just to get back about the talking about the builders, how the builders need to be educated. I know both the HIA and the Master Builders Association have green building components. I know over the last five years, they've really lifted their game in terms of providing information to the builders who've been accredited. They. 
I don't know, I've got to be careful. I don't know if my cynic hat on um, here. I... <laughs> the HIS. I'm actually a Sorry? I'm actually a Yeah. <laughs> Look, it's, it's, it's in, I mean, by and large, the HIA and the NBA have not been great fans of, yeah. um, of, of energy efficient homes. They, they've fought tooth and nail for any improvements in the in, in, in increase in the regulatory requirements. They have fought tooth and nail. They, they have constantly put out things saying that it costs, oh, you can't do that because it's going to cost you know, $10,000 uh, more on, on the cost of, of, of a home um, without any evidence to support, to support that. So, uh, look, my city cat is that, that, that it's all a bit of greenwash. You know, I shouldn't say that. I'm sure there are good builders out there, and there are builders out there that do know what they're do know what they're doing, and do know how to build these things. But the industry it, it, it itself, I, I do find it, they are very hard to to work with, and they really it's, it's really not on their agenda. It's all about it's all about uh, affordability, and you know they, they, it's all, the, the dollar is, is 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 everything. So yeah. Sorry, I'll go to the. You've been very paid right back there. Sorry, um, I just And, uh, but uh, now I can even drill the next plan exactly what I wanted. Uh, the result has been 7.4. Yep. Well, uh, well, not that. for their doing. Um, for instance, just recently we went up the roof and they put an exhaust fan. They took the insulation off. You know, the um, insulation it's over there, still so, yeah. um, around the ceiling. They took the foot yeah. extraction with the ceiling yep. again, took the insulation, left it off. Yep. Things yep. like that, which immediately. Whatever he tried to do, yeah. it's lost. Yeah. So the, mm. the builder might be good, but it's not the builder who's doing it's it. All it's all the all subcontractor. Yep. Yep. Look, yeah, and it's it's a, it's the same. The same. We get the same story with uh, downlights. You know, there is a requirement that you have to uh, remove insulation from from around downlights, but it's only quite a small area. But ten, what tends to happen is the the insulation installers come in and they just they rip a bat in half, and so you've got this huge gap. And we've done so. I have to let me on here, but you know we've done thermal these these four hundred homes that we looked at. We did thermal imaging uh, of the ceilings, and you can see where the town lights are because these big gaps uh, are around them where the insulation has been um, uh, removed. So there are um, there's a whole lot of of, of uh, Educational that right through the entire, not just the builder. And the, the other, the other interesting thing that we that we have seen too with that study that we did is is the compliance side of things. You know the uh, the, the the inspection cycles that 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 are <laughs> all laughing down there. Yeah. The inspection cycles don't. No, they're after the the structural. Uh, so they come and check the slab, and they check the frame, and they check the slab. And there's nothing is done on the energy efficiency aspect. That's all missed by. And I'm, I would think that. Very few building inspectors stick their head up into the uh, ceiling to see whether the insulation has been ceiling insulation has been installed, and they usually don't know whether the wall insulation has been installed because by the time they have blast boards up, and so they've you, got no idea whether it's there or not. So there's a whole issue there around the, the compliance and 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 the checking of the that these things have, have actually been uh, done. Uh, in accordance with not only the building regulations, but also in accordance with what's on the, what's on the plan. So yeah, it's it's back to, just get back to the floor, say, constructability. The store yeah. comes in, yeah. just wants to get in, get out, yeah. pay five hundred dollars, whatever. He doesn't care what the trailing yeah. pieces of the house, and they'll just do whatever that. And they don't basically understand the consequences or no, it's, 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 it's just bang for buck, out there later. Yep. Yep. So, so yeah. yeah. Does that home come with a user manual? Uh, it, it did. With that. They got the they got the entire report that was done <laughs> on, on the house. So I mean, you know, to help the user. Yeah. So that that particular one, yes, it did. Um, but uh, it came with a very very detailed user report. Um, uh, but yeah, I think this is the one of the things that's probably uh, needed um, uh, in in the industry. You know, with nearly any other thing that you buy, you get a user manual, whether you read it or not, I don't know. But you you do actually get a user manual. Uh, whether, whether it's a car, whether it's a blender, whether it's anything, you use your phone. With the house, the most expensive purchase you're ever going to make, you get nothing. Because you mentioned <laughs> the, 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 um, the occupiers' um, behaviour is important. 
Mm. Well, I think as you want to get that, like I said in, in the video, you know, as you want to get the, the particularly with the higher performance homes, as they get higher and higher performance, they require more and more. They won't just do it in isolation. They, they do need that uh, user interaction. They won't, they just won't operate. They'll, they'll perform okay, but that, that, that full potential won't be realised and it really comes down to the, the, the occupiers of the house need to understand how. It's just, it's, it's, as Adam said, it's, it's a bit like a car analogy. If you drive a Prius, uh, like a Ferrari, you, are, you aren't going to get the fuel consumption uh, that, that it states on the, uh, on the Prius manual. Um, so it's, it's a little bit like that with, with houses as, as well. If you don't operate them the way they're meant to be operated, you, you're not going to get the performance uh, that uh, is expected uh, from them. So, yeah. But it's an interesting one about how do you educate the public. Now there's, you preaching to the converted uh, here, so it's, it's really the, the big uh, issue is that the, 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 the vast, vast majority of the buying public, how do you teach them yeah. to uh, the, the benefits of operating their homes effectively? Yeah? Sorry? Yeah? I've got, got an observation, uh, and I'm going to have to put on my sitting account, I think. Uh, I really like the point you made, it doesn't work without the education. But how do we give the incentive to people to take on board that education? The only way I can think of is you put a price on doing it wrong. Yeah, yeah. well, <laughs> yeah. Well, plenty of money's not enough, then I don't know what is. Yeah, so, so I think that's. Look, and I think at the end of the day, I, yeah. I think at the end of the day, it is it is the dollar that drives it, and the, the, dare, dare I say, it, rising electricity prices. Maybe that's a good thing. Our um, biggest <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> well, look, it's great to see. Um, it, it's actually, it's really exciting. There's another. Uh, it, it, it's really exciting. I do some in home, uh, in school uh, sessions with like carbon, carbon kids and, and stuff like. That. And it's look, it's it's really heartening. You go to quickly primary schools and you see kids. They get it. They are really switched on and they understand what you're talking about. And um, so. Yeah, it's it's and, and then they go back and they tell mum and dad. So, oh, you know, we, we should be doing blah blah and blah, blah, and uh, it really does. It, that's encouraging. You you go to those schools, and you talk to those kids, and you and you see how enthusiastic they are. Perhaps the next generation will get it right <laughs> until they become teenagers. Uh, yeah, well, that's right. That's right. All right. One question on Judy, or a comment. Mm. Of, you know, their legs are cold, their head yeah, don't want to get hot, and so they like to have a little bit of a yeah. distract them. And what the, what the sort of implications are? Yeah, they can be. Look, it's again, it's, um, I'll talk about another uh, project that I'm working on. I'm working with um, energy monitoring a whole lot of low income uh, households uh, at, at the moment, and, and that they're acutely uh, aware of, uh, of their energy costs. So they try and minimise. So, uh, their consumption of energy uh, as much as they can. And one of the things that we've seen happening is you now some of these homes have got you know, relatively efficient gas ducted heating systems in them. And they won't use that and instead will use uh, little blow heaters and radiators and stuff like that. And their energy consumption is through the roof because uh, they leave these things on all night. Because I, I think, oh, it's only small, it won't, it won't use anywhere near as much. Uh, energy as my efficient gas stuff. Well, they don't know that it's an efficient gas stuff that heating, but it, it is. So you see these huge increases um, in uh, energy consumption because these little, these little, but the builders don't realise. You know, some of these ones are you know, they're two thousand watts. They're they're they're, 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 they're big. <laughs> they're a lot of power. <laughs> so yeah, it's 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 a tough one because they they can be they they can be uh, real. Um, Real energy traps. Um, yeah. All right, um, ladies and gentlemen. You can, I'll, I'll, um, I'm hanging around. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, let's thank Michael. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. Oh, we'll have um, an informal uh, discussion uh, next door. We have um, slight, um, light. Light. Um, refreshments so we can, you can uh, still uh, ask any further questions
So thank you very much. Thanks all of you. And just stay tuned. Um, next year we have lots of um, more talks. Um, just to give you um, some idea, we are have planning for energy storage solutions and also community energy and few other um, talks. So stay tuned with ATA Melbourne branch website. Thank you very much.